How could a massive aircraft filled with 239 people simply vanish from the face of the earth? It might seem yeah, impossible. Because I watched a Netflix, uh, uh, I watched Netflix on this, and I thought it was really bad. Guys, I said this when I watched it, Jet. What they were saying and the way they were portraying it was so like sensationalized and trying to go at the conclusion that they were looking for that it was like, dude, why are you making this conclusion? It's just shit. Like, why don't you just do a better job at ex explaining something? Instead of, I don't, I don't like that at all. I think was, that was just very poorly made. In the modern era. So but poorly this made. This is exactly what happened in Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 on March 8, 2014. Look at the there are countless theories which try to explain the mysterious disappearance. Everything from a remote control hijacking to exploding fruit in the cargo bay have been suggested. But what if the truth is even more disturbing? What if somebody on board Flight 370 was responsible? This is the chilling story of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. And it's a story that might finally help us find the missing plane. It was a clear night at Kuala Lumpur, the capital city of Malaysia. Monsoon season was coming to a close and calmer conditions had arrived in the region. This calm extended to gate C1 of the satellite terminal of Kuala Lumpur International Airport where a Boeing 777, operated by Malaysia Airlines, was preparing for its journey to Beijing. The aircraft was being fueled and loaded with food, cargo and 227 passengers for the six-hour journey north. As the passengers walked through the jet bridge, none of them could have known that they were about to become a part of the greatest mystery in the history of aviation. Despite the sheer variety of theories surrounding this night, one scenario stands head and shoulders above the rest. This documentary is one of the first tellings of a plausible version of that story in its entirety. Chat, one thing I wish that they didn't know is that it was, is put, put down a foundation of like something that is almost certain, right? Like the way that things happened, it had to be somebody who knew what they were doing. Chat, am, guys, am I wrong about this? I think there's almost no, there's almost no theories that, that imply that something that, it has to be somebody that knew what they were doing, right? In the cockpit of Flight 370 were two pilots, both of whom, in a matter of days, would become the subjects of intense scrutiny. Uh, delivery Malaysia 370, good morning. Malaysia 370, request level. 370, we are ready, requesting flight 340 to Beijing. That's First Officer Fariq Abdul Hamid, requesting clearance to Beijing from air traffic control. This was a special changes. Oh my god, Ryan! Surrounding command. That's First Officer Fariq Abdul Hamid requesting clearance to Beijing from air traffic control. Was this was a special video. flight for the 27 year old. Flight 370 was his last training flight before being signed off to fly the Boeing 777. He had joined Malaysia Airlines as a cadet pilot seven years previously, in 2007, and had flown Boeing 737s and Airbus A330s for the airline before beginning training on the 777 a few months previously. He had established an excellent performance record for himself in this time, and was assessed to be well above average during his progression through the ranks at the airline. In fact, he was doing well enough in his training that the airline considered it safe for him to be paired with just one captain for this flight, rather than the usual two. And sitting to his left was that captain, 53-year-old Zahari Ahmed Shah, Zahari had joined Malaysia Airlines as a cadet pilot in 1981. In this time, he had built up over 18,000 flying hours. This was an immense amount of experience, and it made him one of the most experienced pilots in the country. Zahari held a senior position at the airline. As well as being responsible for taking hundreds of people around the world as a 777 captain, for the last seven years, he had also been training pilots to fly the 777 and examining them to decide whether they should be granted their license. Zahari was described by colleagues as jovial, knowledgeable, and a true aviation geek, who spent his spare time flying remote control planes, paragliding, and inviting colleagues to his home to practice procedures on his home flight simulator. Oh, but in the scenario which we're now exploring, there was much more to Captain Zahari than would be suggested by his disarming exterior. Oscar. 
At just before 12.30 that night, eight minutes ahead of schedule, the jet bridge was removed and the massive aircraft was pushed back from the gate. It was now a sealed vessel, operating under its own power and untethered to the outside world. On board were 227 passengers, 10 flight attendants and 49 metric tons of fuel. Some would later speculate that the captain took on an unnecessarily large or even a suspicious amount of fuel, Wait, about 30 much? minutes more than was acquired for the distance. But the truth is that Malaysia Airlines mandated all Beijing-bound flights to take on 30 minutes of additional holding fuel, so there is nothing suspicious here. Zahari nudged the 777's throttles forwards and began taxiing out to runway 32 right at Kuala Lumpur. It was procedure at Malaysia Airlines that the captain should taxi the aircraft on the ground, while the first officer handled the radio. Chat, chat, isn't the extra chat to be, to be possible for like a, like a, if, if there's problems with the fucking runway or like there's like con weather conditions to stall and yes. shit and have more time? Is Once that the plane had reached get, the runway, the first officer shit? would take over and fly the aircraft to Beijing, with the captain handling the radios. Okay, I'm holding film. As Zahari taxied out to the runway, the passengers settled in and tried to get some sleep. Mm -hmm. They would soon be in for a rude awakening. At 20 minutes to one that morning, the aircraft lined up at the runway. Ahead of it were four kilometers of concrete and a dark, open sky. 370-32 Captain Zahari pushed the enormous Rolls-Royce engines to take off thrust and then handed over control to First Officer Farik as their 777 began thundering down the runway. Within moments, Farik lifted the massive aircraft into the night sky and Flight 370 began its journey north. As the plane climbed out, Zahari contacted departure control. Departure Malaysia uh, 370. Malaysia 370, selamat pagi. Identify climb flight level 180. Can send a side eater right direct to Ikari. Okay, level 180 direct Ikari, Malaysia 370. As well as clearing the flight to climb to 18,000 feet, the controller had given the pilots a shortcut, mm -hmm. allowing them to go straight to a waypoint further along their route, known as Igari. This waypoint, Igari, is kind of an unusual one. It's one of the few waypoints on the planet which is bordered by a total of five different airspaces, namely those of Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam and Singapore. This fact will take on an eerie significance in the scenario which we're about to explore. Oh, damn. Yeah, the plane continued climbing out as normal, leaving behind the bright orange sea of lights that was Kuala Lumpur. Its flight plan would take it northeast over the Malaysian Peninsula and then out over the South China Sea. Before long, the departure controller handed Flight 370 off to Lumpur Radar Control, who was responsible for a higher altitude portion of the country's airspace. 370, contact Lumpur Radar 1326 Alright, 1326 Zahari dialed this frequency into his radio set and made contact with the new controller. Lumpur Control Malaysia uh, 370. Malaysia 370, Lumpur Radar, good morning. Time flight level 250. Morning level 250, Malaysia uh, 370. Also, oh, they have to connect to that so far, airspace. Everything so was going to plan. It was a clear, moonless night. The aircraft was in good condition and there was little other traffic in the vicinity. All the pilots needed to be fully on their way was the final clearance from air traffic control to climb to their cruising altitude. And at about a quarter to one that morning, that clearance came. Malaysian 370, climb flight level 350. Climb level 350, Malaysian uh, 370. About 20 minutes after takeoff, flight 370 had reached this cruising altitude of flight level 350, or about 35,000 feet. When it did, Zahari made a routine report to air traffic control. About six minutes later, he made this report again. It wasn't necessary for him to make this report a second time, but the fact that he did doesn't really tell us much. Anything from sleepiness to simple forgetfulness so forget, could have been yeah. responsible. Fair enough. Up until now, for the passengers, Flight 370 had been about as routine as a flight can get. The flight attendants were making their way through the cabin with the meal service for those who were still awake. 
However, most of the passengers were asleep by this point. What happened next is the subject of much controversy. For this video, we'll apply Occam's razor, which holds that the theory which requires the fewest assumptions is most likely to be the right one. The following account is not definitive, but it is the most consistent with the known facts, mm. and it is supported by some of the world's leading authorities on the subject. At 19 minutes past one, as flight 370 well, neared the waypoint- yeah, 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 this is really hard to because, because we don't know a lot about aviation. Is, is doing a double like that so rare that it's worth like, uh, maybe thinking, oh, this, this, this could be a cry for help or whatever. Like, chat, if somebody's, let's say, let's say in a world where you have a gun to your head, right? And, and the, you think about what can I say so that to get the attention of the fucking, you say, oh, dude, oh, dude, I have, I need to make a, I need to say, yo, I need to say this in the, in the mic and then say this. And if they say, oh, dude, like, does that make sense or not? Okay, whatever. Point to Gary. Malaysian air traffic control told the crew to contact Ho Chi Minh air traffic control as they would soon be entering Vietnamese airspace. Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120, decimal 9. Good night. Good night, Malaysian 370. Much has been made in the media of this radio transmission by the captain. That's because, technically, a pilot is also supposed to read back the radio frequency they've been assigned, so the controller knows that the pilot has heard them correctly. But pilots who know an airspace well, like Zahari did, sometimes don't read back the frequency. So, there is truly nothing unusual about Zahari simply saying goodnight as he switched over to Ho Chi Minh. What is strange, however, is what happened next. And here is where our scenario begins. Just seconds after saying goodnight to Lumper Control, Captain Zahari asked First Officer Farik to go back into the cabin and get them both a cup of coffee. They had five hours of night flying ahead of them. A shot of caffeine wouldn't go amiss. The first officer dutifully headed back to the galley and closed the cockpit door behind him. Normally, the cabin crew would bring the coffee, but Farik was not about to question the man who held his career in his hands. Now, sitting alone in the warm cocoon of the cockpit, was a man who had been rehearsing for this night for over a month. Every step, every movement, had been planned with the utmost precision. And it had to be, because Zahari was trying to pull off the impossible. He would now try to make one of the world's largest, most modern jets vanish from the face of the earth. Safely locked behind his bulletproof cockpit door, ironically designed to keep would-be hijackers out, he could now carry out this plan without interruption. He reached back into his flight bag behind his seat, pulled out a warm sweater and put it on. He would be needing it in a moment. Zahari had chosen this exact moment to make the plane disappear because for these precious few minutes, nobody on the ground was expecting to hear from the aircraft. Malaysian controllers had handed him off to Viet. Guys, any conclusions that we don't know how, but just for the sake of the video, let it, let it, let, let him go and not, don't complain. Now, and, we'll see how it goes. and Vietnamese controllers were busy with the aircraft which were already in their airspace. As far as they were concerned, it would be a few minutes before Flight 370 checked in. So, for these precious few moments, Flight 370 was in limbo. Nobody in the world was watching. Zahari's first step in making the plane vanish was to make it disappear from radar. To do this, he needed to turn off the plane's transponder. But he wasn't going to do this straight away. If he did it before he reached Agari, Malaysian air traffic control might notice him dropping off their radar screens. If he waited until he had reached the waypoint, he would truly be out of their jurisdiction. As the first officer obliviously fixed a coffee in the forward galley, or whatever counted for coffee on an aircraft, Zahari fixed his eyes on a gari, as it inched ever closer at 8 miles per minute. When the active waypoint at the top right of this screen here changed from Igari to Bitod, the next waypoint en route, that would be his trigger to turn off the transponder. That and makes after sense, a few actually. moments, it came. The aircraft reached Igari and began turning towards its next waypoint. At exactly that moment, Zahari switched off the transponder. Flight 370 disappeared from air traffic control screens in Malaysia, Vietnam, sure. Thailand, and Cambodia. Step one was complete. But unbeknownst to Zahari, he had left a clue. The first of a few clues he would leave over the coming hours, and a clue that ultimately took investigators years to uncover. The transponder of the Boeing 777 has basically three settings. Fully off, where no information is transmitted to air traffic control, altitude off, where only the plane's position, but not its altitude, is transmitted to air traffic control, and fully on, 
where its position, altitude, and a few other parameters are transmitted. For a split second, as the Harry twisted the dial towards the fully off position, it passed through the alt off position. Unbeknownst to him, oh, for that telling split second, as the dial passed through alt off, stations on the ground received the plane's position while its altitude read zero. That's this is massive. not what would happen if the plane had experienced a massive electrical failure, leading to the loss of the transponder, among other systems. If that had happened, all of the data would have been lost at once. This brief partial loss of transponder data suggests that somebody in the cockpit was turning this dial manually to the off position. But this clue wouldn't be discovered for a long time. As far as Zahari was concerned, step one of his plan had been completed successfully. From that moment, nobody on the ground knew where Flight 370 was. The plane continued turning towards Betad, the next waypoint on its route. I don't know about the coffee thing, I don't know. I, I... Except there was still a problem. By disabling the transponder, Zahari had made the plane invisible to air traffic controllers, but Malaysia Airlines still knew that the plane was in the air. That's because the 777 is equipped with ACARS, or Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System. This feeds status reports from the plane to the airline via a satellite communication system called SATCOM. These status reports include information about the plane's fuel on board, its maintenance status, and even its position along its flight route every 30 minutes. Zahari knew that he couldn't truly disappear as long as ACARS was still functioning. So he needed to disable it. But disabling ACARS was not going to be as easy as turning off the transponder. If he turned ACARS off the usual way, it would send a yeah, message to the ground right? saying that it was being powered down. Not a great prospect if your mission is to disappear without a trace. To truly vanish without leaving a trace, the captain would need to do something far more drastic. He would need to essentially pull the plug right out of the socket so that ACARS would go dark immediately without sending this telltale log off message. To do this, Zahari reached up to the overhead panel and, using two fingers, turned off both engines' electrical generators. This instantly cut off the electrical supply to a whole host of aircraft systems, including the SATCOM, the satellite communication system which ACARS uses to send and receive its messages. Now, there was no way for anyone on the ground to receive information from the plane. Just to be sure, he then went through the menu on his flight management computer and deselected the two ways by which ACARS can communicate with the ground, SATCOM and VHF radio. Now, even if SATCOM came back on, ACARS wouldn't be able to talk to the ground. As far as the outside world was concerned, it was at this spot over the South China Sea where chat, MH370... Chat, chat. All commercial airlines like this, are, are some of these features needed? Do you, do you need to like turn some of those off and on? Why, why do you have so much control over this on the commercial airline from the pilot uh, spot? Advanced. Yeah, there is a kind of fair enough then. Disabling the SATCOM also had another benefit, which would be absolutely essential for the next step of the captain's why, plan. Why would you turn it off? It meant that the satellite phone in the passenger cabin and the text message facility in the passenger's in-flight entertainment systems would no longer work. All lines of communication between Flight 370 and the outside world had been severed. To make assurance doubly sure, Zahari then turned off the plane's external lights. Now, Flight 370 was fully invisible. All of this happened in the space of less than a minute. But these were only the first steps in Zahari's grand plan. He had successfully hidden the aircraft from the people on the ground, but behind him, 238 people were expecting to be flown to Beijing. The first officer was making coffee and he would be returning to the cockpit very shortly. To carry out his full plan, Zahari would somehow need to incapacitate every single person on the aircraft. Uh, he, he did it almost instantly. And to that end, he had at his disposal a rather unconventional weapon. Air. Or, more yeah, specifically, sure. thin air. At 35,000 feet, there is only enough air to keep a human meaningfully conscious for about 45 seconds. Yeah, like instant, yeah, but the oh. air inside a passenger aircraft is pressurized. It's compacted, like the gas in a soft drink can. If the captain could somehow open a hole in his plane, most of this air would come rushing out. Luckily for him, he could open a hole. On the underside of the plane, there were two valves, aptly named outflow valves. By opening them, he could vent all of this condensed air out into the atmosphere. The captain readied himself. 
he reached into the panel on his left hand side, pulled out his oxygen mask, placed it over his head, and started the flow of oxygen. Now that he had his own oxygen supply, he swung his right hand up to the overhead panel and prevented the engines from bringing new air into the cabin. Then, he pressed a switch which turned the aircraft's cabin pressurization from automatic to manual. Now he controlled the amount of air inside the aircraft's cabin. He had in his hands the air supply, the very lifeblood of all 238 people behind him. Once he carried out this next step, there would be no turning back. The next few seconds were the most critical in his entire plan. Just as he had rehearsed, Zahari moved his fingers down to the two cabin outflow valve switches and pushed them to the open position. On the belly of the aircraft, the two valves opened. There was a tremendous whoosh inside the cabin as the air came rushing out. Any passengers who had been sleeping were startled awake by the noise and the change in air pressure. Their ears popped and the oxygen masks dropped automatically from the ceiling. The sudden expansion of the air inside the cabin made it significantly colder, adding to the passengers' shock. But before the bewildered passengers even had a chance to put their masks on, the captain yanked the plane violently to the left. In the forward galley, the Whoa. first officer was slammed to the sidewall by the dramatic turn. He only had seconds to find an oxygen mask in the pandemonium before he would fall unconscious. The captain was holding the plane in the turn so steep that the automated bank angle warning sounded. The plane was at the edge of its capabilities, straining to stay aloft as the captain turned harder and harder. But this wasn't done for dramatic effect. Zahari needed this turn to be tight. He was right beside Thai airspace, and the last thing he bro, wanted bro, was to dude, burst into dude. an airspace which he hadn't been cleared to enter. Dude, that is so much fucking plan- Okay, hold on, hold on. I get it that this, that this might be true. There's a so much because in there. Because even though he had disabled that. the transponder, Bruh. there was still one way that he could be detected. Primary radar. Primary radar is the most basic kind of radar, and it works on the very simple principle of reflectance. A radar dish on the ground sends out a signal which bounces off any objects in the air, including planes and flocks of birds, and is reflected back to the radar dish. Because it just works by bouncing radio waves off an aircraft's skin, there was no way for a pilot to avoid being detected by primary radar. But at the same time, because it's such a simple system, all it can tell is where an object is. It can't tell what it is, or how high it is. If Thailand's military spotted an unidentified target infringing upon their airspace, they could well scramble fighter jets to investigate who the mystery intruder was. So, as Zahari rolled rings level, just over two minutes after beginning his turn, he checked his position on his navigation display. To his relief, he had just about managed to avoid Thai airspace. Flight 370 was now headed in the opposite direction, back towards Malaysia. The first part of Zahari's mission was complete, but a massive challenge still lay ahead of him. He would now have to cross back over the Malaysian peninsula without being intercepted by the Malaysian or Thai Air Force. And he would have to do this without having his plan spoiled by the 238 people behind him. In the main cabin, the passengers were startled and confused. They had put on their oxygen masks and were listening intently to the cabin crew's instructions. The cabin crew told them that there had been a rapid decompression and that they would be descending to a breathable altitude soon. Apart from how cold the cabin had gotten, and the fact that the oxygen masks had dropped, the situation appeared to be under control. Noise levels in the cabin were normal, and now that the sharp turn was finished, the plane was more or less flying steadily. But First Officer Farik knew that this situation was anything but under control. Nowhere in any depressurization checklist does it say that the pilots should turn the plane around. Their first priority, after donning their oxygen masks, is to descend to an altitude where the air is breathable. Whatever was going on up front, it had to be very strange. During the steep turn, Farik had scrambled to sit at one of the cabin crew stations in the forward galley, and he had grabbed an oxygen mask there. He now, he was ready to there, return right? to the cockpit to help the captain with the emergency. But secure on the other side of the impenetrable cockpit door, the captain had other plans. Passenger oxygen masks only provide about 20 minutes of oxygen. The reason for that is that this gives enough time for the pilots to descend to a safe altitude where the air is breathable. This usually takes about 10 minutes. None of the passengers or crew knew it yet, but they would not be descending to a breathable altitude. 
their time was running out. That's crazy that the margin is so small. First Officer Farik approached the cabin interphone at the forward left door, his heart pounding. Over his shoulder was slung one of the plane's portable oxygen bottles, which he had grabbed from its compartment. He had attached the flexible plastic mask to his face and was breathing heavily from it as he brought his fingers to the handset. There were 15 of these oxygen bottles distributed throughout the cabin, one for each of the flight attendants on a maximum crew flight. There were just 10 cabin crew on board Flight 370, so there was more than enough for each of them. And unlike the passenger oxygen masks, these bottles had 44 minutes of oxygen, more than the crew could possibly need in any conceivable emergency. But this emergency had never been conceived of. Farik was the only person on board breathing from a portable oxygen bottle. The flight attendants had followed their training and had quickly sat down at one of the spare passenger seats or at a flight attendant station and grabbed the 20 minute drop down mask there. But Farik's situation was different. He was badly needed in the cockpit and a portable oxygen bottle was the only way to stay conscious while he tried to regain entry. He picked up the handset dialed the code to call the cockpit door and put the receiver to his ear. In the cockpit, a message appeared on the captain's central display, cabin call. If Sahari wanted to open the door, all he had to do was rotate the switch on the centre pedestal from the auto position to the unlock position. The door would unlock, the light on the entry keypad outside the door would turn green and Farik would be able to push it open. Farik waited and watched as the light on the entry keypad continued glowing red. It should only have taken a second for the captain to unlock the door. Why was he not doing this? The first officer figured that he must have been very busy handling whatever emergency this was. He waited for a few moments and then dialed the cockpit again. The cabin call message (laughs) appeared on the captain's display and again he ignored it. This was terrifying. The aircraft had depressurized and it wasn't descending. Something was going seriously wrong up front in the cockpit. On the other side of the door, Zahari fixed his eyes ahead out his windscreen and onto the orange lights of the seaside town of Kotobaru. This was his entry point for his journey back across his home country, and it was perfect for this mission. His plan was to skirt the border between Thai airspace and Malaysian airspace. This way, when the Malaysian military saw the plane on radar, they would assume that it was being handled by Thai controllers And likewise, when the Thai military saw the plane, they would assume that it was being handled by Malaysian controllers. And, Zahari figured, even if they did realise that it was Malaysia Flight 370 after seeing it turn back at Agari, they may think that it was making an emergency return to an airport, perhaps Penang's airport, where it appeared to be heading. If this was the case, the flight would be the concern of the civilian controllers, who were surely dealing with the plane. But, in reality... Malaysian civilian controllers had handed the plane off to Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. Chad, do we want to have like a general like sky map of like where planes are going and where they should be or whatever? Like, if, if some guy peeps, if, if something peeps like four or five times back in and out of the fucking airspace, don't they have like an idea of like, oh, maybe something should be there or not be there? They weren't even thinking about it anymore. Flight even 370. Off, they're still getting the beach though. Meanwhile, their, locked out of the cockpit, their shit, their First radar. Officer Farik could tell that despite the depressurization, the plane had still not begun to descend. He then had a terrible thought. What if the reason the door wasn't opening oh my God. was that the captain had- Radars? Get info back from the fucking- from the plane's surface. The skin of the fucking plane sends the data back and they get a beep, bro. Even if they turn it off, the people on the ground's radars, they get it had Are become you incapacitated by the rapid decompression. This would be odd though. After all, donning the oxygen masks was the first item on the checklist, which is completed even before the descent is initiated. And what's more, Captain Zahari regularly taught this scenario to pilots in the airline's flight simulators. This he was crazy. more qualified than almost anybody to handle such an emergency. How could he simply forget to put on his oxygen mask? But there was no time for Freak to work this out. He needed to get back inside the cockpit. And for that, he had one last option. Cockpit door keypads don't just accept one code. As well as the normal code, there is a special code for the rare event in which the pilots are incapacitated and the cabin crew need to gain access. With this code, the door opens automatically if the pilots haven't responded after 30 seconds. But of course, this emergency code could easily be used by hijackers to gain entry to the cockpit. 
So, to prevent this, in the cockpit, pilots deny. have the option of turning the door switch to the deny position within 30 seconds of the code being entered. This clever logic allows crews to gain entry to the cockpit in case of a pilot incapacitation, but also gives flight crew the ability to deny entry to hijackers. The first officer hurried over to the keypad and punched in the emergency code. Chat. A loud buzzer sounded. It should take two knobs to deny it. Here's my thoughts about this engineering Andy over here. It should take two knobs. What if, chat? What if some guy passes out and his head falls and he hits, boom, the knob and it goes deny it? Then what? A one point of, a one point of failure to turn an aircraft this big? Hell no. The cockpit. The if the captain was incapacitated, the door would automatically open for Farik in just 30 seconds. You say no shot until 250 people die of this shit. The fuck? 10 seconds passed, then 20. But those final seconds came and went, and the keypad light remained red. A horrible, sinking feeling came over the first officer. He entered the code once again, this time more carefully, and he waited, counting down the seconds using his watch. Okay, well, and yet again, after 30 seconds, the light remained red. This could only mean one thing. On the other side of the cockpit door, the captain had heard the buzzer and had turned the switch to deny. The captain checked his watch. The time was 32 minutes past 1 in the morning, 12 minutes since he had turned his 777 back on itself. About 5 minutes from now, the passenger's oxygen masks would begin to run out. When they did, all 227 of them would become hypoxic. The 10 flight attendants were in much the same boat, still strapped in and waiting for the signal from the captain that they were free to walk about the cabin. The effects of hypoxia are much like the effects of alcohol, with some people becoming euphoric and giddy, others becoming angry, and others still becoming contented and relaxed. Contrary to what many people think, you don't suffocate in a decompression. There is simply a dimming of awareness until the proverbial lights go out. Ironically, the very loss of mental faculties which occurs in hypoxia prevents the realization that it is even happening. In the cockpit, Zahari made a minor adjustment to stay on course as he carefully scanned the skies around him. He was now back over land, zooming across peninsular Malaysia. He had been flying in these skies for decades, day and night, and he knew the lay of the land so well that he could easily identify the various towns en route as he flew overhead. He knew that at his current speed, he would be able to cross the peninsula in about 20 minutes. As he flew, he had his radio tuned to the Kuala Lumpur air traffic control frequency. He could hear the controller talking to the other planes as normal. At least for now, it was business as usual in Malaysia. At Ho Chi Minh, however, controllers had noticed something odd. The Malaysia Airlines flight from Kuala Lumpur, Flight 370, hadn't made contact. This wasn't overly concerning, Sometimes it takes a few minutes before pilots get in touch. Minutes. But what was unusual was that the flight wasn't even showing up on radar, despite having been handed over by Lumper Control almost 20 minutes earlier. The controller tried contacting the flight over the radio. But Ho Chi Minh was far from Zahari's mind at this point. As controllers there counted up the minutes since he was supposed to have made contact, he was counting down the minutes until the passengers and crew would lose consciousness. As for his own oxygen supply, he was at no risk of running out. His supply came from two large tanks underneath the cockpit, which had enough oxygen to last two pilots 13 hours, or one pilot 27 hours. These tanks are topped up a few times each year, and luckily for Zahari, or perhaps uh, I'm just, just luckily, this oxygen supply had been topped up that very evening, just before the plane had departed Kuala Lumpur. Take a look at this. It's a scanned copy of the actual tech log from Flight 370. This is one of the last pieces of paper generated by the flight before it left Kuala Lumpur. Above ground, I understand that the lights are down, but the, the no cameras see it from that distance. So there's no, nobody see anything. But does not pick it up. Nobody, nobody sent. It, are the chat? It, the, 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 the people said that the radars find them anyway. Did the radars not pick them up in the sky? I don't get it. The tech log is the booklet where engineers and pilots note down any faults with the aircraft and whether they need fixing before the plane goes on its next flight. There are two things which stick out in this document. First, under defect description, the engineer Dang. wrote, I'm a slinger. You're not a slinger. 
both the systems for the location are off, okay? Who cares? Who cares? The Raiders on the fucking ground do their own job, bitch ass. The ground, radar, pick up the plane location themselves. You don't need to give them anything. They do it themselves on their own. What are you on about? Nil and nil notes. In other words, no maintenance needed. He also crossed out these fields to show that nothing was needed. But then, sometime later that evening, an engineer did make an entry. Crew oxygen system replenished to 1800 PSI. Sometime between when the plane arrived at Kuala Lumpur earlier in the day and when it left again that night as MH370, somebody decided that the pilot's oxygen needed to be topped up. Whether it was Zahari has never been determined. The first officer was beginning to panic. Oh. No matter how many times he entered the code, the light remained red. He began to bang his oxygen mask against the cockpit door in a desperate bid to get the captain's attention. Ho Chi Minh air traffic control was growing concerned. Flight 370 had still not turned- Okay, you're dented. Boom. He explained it. Ground can't tell what the plane is, if it's a plane at all, or right. If that's when you send the fucking jets. That is when, that's when, if that's a fucking problem. You go, yo, bro, military, send the fucking fighter jets, bro. What the fuck? Turned up the radar, about? and it hadn't answered any of their calls. The controller had tried asking other planes in the area to make radio contact with the plane, including on the international distress frequency. What the fuck? These aircraft had reached out, but were met with nothing but silence. After repeated efforts to call the missing aircraft, the controller at Ho Chi Minh telephoned the controller at Kuala Lumpur and told him that he had not been able to make radar contact with Flight 370. He asked whether the flight had turned back to Kuala Lumpur, but the Malaysian controller told him that it hadn't. Fears were now beginning to grow that something terrible had happened to the flight. The control- A bird doesn't ping fucking all the way through and bing 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 Bro, one bird doesn't fucking probably just fucking spam the pings from one bird, bro. It moves around, bitch. He goes around. Birds fucking fly and shit, you fucking loser. Oh, guys. Uh, guys, we have uh, uh, in the sky, guys, big flock of birds. Oh, yeah, these are my lords, bro. Yeah, that's air, air traffic control, guys. Yeah, we got the pigeons, guys. Maybe some crows. Yo, dude, what's up? Holy fuck, would you fucking shut the fuck up, piggy? You fucking birds, shut the fuck up, the massa. Holy fuck, you shut the fucking right there, bro. I can't watch this radio shit. Radio I'm over it. In case it had returned to his airspace. Zahari was listening out but remained silent. For the first time that night, he had confirmation that the ground knew his plane was missing. The time was 1.41 in the morning, 20 minutes after the flight had disappeared from radar. Controllers are supposed to report when an aircraft takes more than five minutes to make contact. Clearly, the air traffic control system was not at its best tonight. And as Zahari watched out his window, he hoped that the Malaysian military was just as sleepy, because right at that moment, his plane was a blip on their primary radar screens, racing southwest across the peninsula. Bro, how come this is fucking human controlled? Bro, there should be a fucking ticker, right? Be, 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 be. That, that, that if, if within five minutes, right, they haven't made contact one way or another, at 10 minutes, it sends like a major alert that there's nothing that came from that plane. Automatically, this should be, this should be coded into the system. What the fuck? Bro, the fact that you need a human, human to go, yo, did they, did these guys, yo, five minutes? Bro, it should be automatic at cutoffs. Five, ten, whatever. And at 15, it's like, bro, we're sending the fucking uh, global tanks, bro. What the so fuck? So Harry could see the lights of Penang. Send some nukes or some shit, bro. Once what the there, fuck is this? He would carry out the next step of his plan. Around this time, the passenger oxygen masks began to run out. Gradually, the low chatter which had pervaded the aircraft began to fade. In a matter of minutes, all 227 passengers would be unconscious. And unless pressurization was restored, not long after that, they would suffer irreversible brain damage from oxygen deprivation. And then, death. Flight 370 looked like any other plane as it whispered along high above the Malaysian countryside. But it was now becoming a flying mausoleum for all but one of its occupants. What a nice plane though. First Officer Farik was growing increasingly desperate. None of his attempts to get back into the cockpit had worked. He had to try something it's different. It's a nice plane model. I like planes. He knew that at this altitude, his mobile phone would have no signal. However, at one of the cabin crew stations, there was a satellite phone. 
Maybe, he figured, if he could get through to the airline, somebody might be able to help him. Farid Guys, began making his way it back its to wing the cabin. Upwards, it's cool the shit clock then. was ticking. Farid still had about 20 minutes of oxygen in his tank, but as he walked back through the cabin, he was beginning to feel lightheaded. Even though his mask was providing 100% oxygen, it was not designed to be used at high altitude for prolonged periods of time. By comparison, the captain was wearing a full face mask with a tight seal, and which was specifically designed to deliver oxygen at a positive pressure. This meant that it forced oxygen into his lungs at a rate which ensured that he received as much of it as he needed. And with 26 hours of oxygen remaining, he was in no rush to repressurize the plane. By now, he had calculated, all of the passengers, and most, if not all of the crew, had lost consciousness. On his lower central monitor, he could see the first officer through the CCTV, slowly walking away from the door, back into the main cabin. Hold up. Check. Even at high altitude, does, since they're above land, the, the, nobody's cell phone ping any towers at all or whatever, or some Wi-Fi shit? Did nobody's, any passenger's cell phones ping anything at all? I don't believe that. Now at the I, other I end of the it. Malaysian Peninsula, Sahari had reached the next important step in his plan. Ahead of him lay the Indonesian island of Sumatra. As far as Sahari was concerned, this was an impenetrable wall. There were primary radar installations up and down the island, and there was no guarantee that the Indonesians would be as blasé about an unidentified aircraft as the Malaysians had been. If he wanted to escape, he had to avoid Indonesian airspace altogether. You fucking loser. So, for the next part of his plan, you fucking bitch. You loser ch Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm pulling the map out. This chat doesn't understand that, that, that Earth is covered in, in satellites and shit. Brother, do you understand that, that the fucking, that the globe is like in a fucking net of satellites? Hold on. Maybe should we show this? So you, you do learn it once. Yo, 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 where's the map at? Bruh, hold up. Let me, let, me, let me show this. Guys, I'm not kidding. The whole. Yes, it's not that I know everything. Is that some of these shit? It, 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 it's out there. Look, look. It's, it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. Dude! Guys, when, whenever you're, someone's out of the towers, there's, there's other shit. Is there no, no cell phone at all or no device that, that, that pings anything at all? It things just can't go full dark. It's just not that's just not a thing. What the fuck? Because it doesn't go fully dark. Oh my god, I, I give up. He would need to turn to the right and fly up the Strait of Malacca. This way, he would remain inside Malaysian airspace all the way until he went out of range of so Prime has radar. It, Far below him, on his right hand side, was the island of Penang. He had so grown up on this me. island, and now. He would fly over it one last time. Zahari twisted the heading select knob on the autopilot and the aircraft began a slow sweeping turn to the right. As it did, the first officer held his mobile phone against the passenger window and tried desperately to make a call. His attempts to use the onboard satellite phone had proved fruitless. He didn't know it, but the SATCOM, the satellite communication system, had been disabled by the captain. Farid could see the distinctive island of Penang beneath him, along with its airport, which he had flown to many times. This was the first time since leaving the cockpit that he had a clear idea of where the aircraft was. Yeah, Normally... Look, look at this shit, bro. Bro, look at this shit. Bro, look at this shit. You think that there's not a singular thing on this bitch ass that gets any of anything? Look at this shit. Bro, bro, it's everywhere, bro. What the fuck? What the fuck? That's just Starlink. Bro, you have, when you have all of them, it's covered. Chat, that's just Starlink. Chat, my phone has a little satellite icon when I'm out of range. It's a little satellite. They've, this entire flight, the whole way through, not a singular thing. There's anything. Ah, uh, bro, I uh, no shots. No shots. Mobile phones cannot get a signal at the speeds and altitudes that are on the But with the plane in a turn, its distance to the cell tower on Penang remained roughly constant. So, for a few short seconds, the first officer's mobile phone, an iPhone 5, connected to the ground station at Penang. 
but far from being able to make a call, all that Farik got was a brief, fleeting signal bar at the top of his screen. For a few seconds, the cell phone tower registered a signal hit, indicating that the phone was on. I was on, right. My clock is more. about this long. When this the signal bar disappeared, long. Look Farik my knew that he was truly out of options. Uh, Barely able to man. stand up from hypoxia and exhaustion, he made his way back to the cockpit door. Still in complete control, the captain rolled out on a northwest heading. Some have suggested that this turn around Penang was Zahari bidding a final farewell to his hometown. However, this is unlikely. For one thing, the turn began after the plane had passed the island, so it wasn't really a turn around the island. And besides, the turn was too shallow for the captain to have been able to see the island anyway. Sentimentality had no place in the cockpit of Flight 370. What mattered was the mission. And the mission was far from over. It had been just about 35 minutes since Sahari had depressurized the plane and turned it back over the Malaysian Peninsula. He had managed to get across the peninsula without being intercepted by fighter jets, but he still had a significant challenge ahead of him, because Malaysia Airlines had just found out that something was amiss with Flight 370. At Lumpur Radar Control, the supervisor on duty telephoned Malaysia Airlines Dispatch Centre, telling them that Ho Chi Minh had been unable to contact Flight 370 or see it on radar. The dispatcher at Malaysia Airlines checked the airline's online flight tracking system to locate the flight on the map. It showed Flight 370 to be in Cambodian airspace. Of course, in reality, Flight 370 no, I'm a, I'm a, was nowhere I'm, I'm, near guys, Cambodia. Guys, I don't want to be rude, what the dispatcher I don't want to be rude. Know, Everybody is, is as responsible. Yo, I don't want to fucking hear it, dude. When you have these jobs, if you're not if you're not gonna uphold a standard that it, that is safe for people, dude, you shouldn't have that job in the first place. Otherwise, you're responsible. I said it, bro. This flight I tracking system I didn't down use the live information down from the, the aircraft to update its position. Rather, it simply projected its last known position out into the future. Since the plane's last known position was over the South China Sea, heading northeast, that's where the flight tracker showed it to be. So far as Malaysia Airlines was concerned, and now air traffic control authorities too, that's where Flight 370 was. They had no idea that at that very moment, the aircraft was hundreds of kilometers to the southwest in Malaysian airspace, speeding up the Strait of Malacca. But it still wasn't good news to the airline that one of its flights hadn't checked in with air traffic control. The dispatcher at Malaysia Airlines sent an ACARS text message to the cockpit printer, asking the pilots to contact Ho Chi Minh immediately. But this message didn't. What message, Sabra? Please contact Ho Chi Minh. They complain, cannot track you on the radar. Please acknowledge these messages. A text, okay? Asking okay. the pilots to contact Ho Chi Minh immediately. But this message didn't make it to the cockpit of Flight 370. The captain had stopped the A cars from being able to communicate with the outside world right after he had removed power from the SATCOM. He was intent on ensuring that not a single clue about the aircraft's status or position made it back to air traffic control or Malaysia Airlines. However, even with the ACARS disabled, there was still one big thorn in Zahari's side. He knew that at Langkawi Airport in the Malaysian state of Kedah, there was a primary radar station. He also knew that the range of this radar was 200 nautical miles. For every second he spent inside the range of this radar, he risked being discovered and intercepted by fighter jets. Because he couldn't avoid this radar, his strategy for this part of the mission was to blend in. Even at night, plenty of commercial aircraft fly up and down the Strait of Malacca, on their way between Kuala Lumpur and Europe in the Middle East. To anybody looking at the radar that night, Flight 370 would appear as just one more dot moving serenely up the Strait of Malacca. Just another dot. Eerie silence now filled the path. That makes no sense. Just another dot, bro. If you, if it, it, bro, if you're like the military, just another dot could be a fucking nuke. What the fuck? Yo, they could be a fucking missile. Another dot could be a bomb. What the fuck? Passenger cabin of the triple seven. Makes no sense at all. It had been almost an hour since the plane was depressurized, and all of the passengers were either okay. unconscious chat, or chat, dead. Chat. This is your country's air defense system. Guys, th guys, there's something that we don't we don't know about in the sky right now. Okay, yo, yo, there's something in the sky, guys. It's just a dot, bruh. Chill out, bruh. It's a dot, man. Yo, it's triggered by pixels, dumbass. What the fuck? What are you doing? The then? first officer and any cabin crew who had used portable oxygen bottles with a 44-minute supply had slipped into unconsciousness too. At an altitude of 35,000 feet, 
even 100% oxygen delivered through a portable oxygen bottle is not enough to stay meaningfully conscious. The only person alive and functioning was the one up in the cockpit. But the situation which he had created was now beginning to have unexpected side effects for his plane, and these had nothing to do with his oxygen supply. Back at Agari, when the captain had cut power to the plane's two main electrical generators, the aircraft's computers had diverted the limited remaining electrical power to only the plane's most essential systems. It's cold as fucking but now, almost an hour after this had happened, the plane had begun throwing up warnings, saying that the computer room underneath the cockpit, known as the e and &E bay, was getting too hot. Oh. Its cooling fans were one of the things which had lost power when the main electrical generators were depowered. So Harry didn't fancy finding out what would happen if the computers which powered his cockpit screens and the aircraft's massively complicated systems overheated. According to his checklists, the very least that would happen was that his screens would start going blank. Without them, he would not be able to complete his mission. He had to restore power to the cooling fans. Flight 370 was nearing the edge of Lankawi's primary radar. After this, Zahari would be free, totally unseen by the outside world. He decided that once he was outside of radar range, he would be safe. Only then would he restore full electrical functionality to the plane. Meanwhile, oh, I get air traffic it. controllers I get it in Malaysia and Vietnam yes. were becoming increasingly- He says mission, because I think he tried to portray the guy as some like, I think he's like a cuck lord, right? Who wants to like not just crash the plane and kill people or whatever. That guy has like this like aviation master mindset like guys, I'm gonna do this and just disappear and nobody's gonna get caught me, dude, because I'm such a like knowledgeable in my plane shit. That's what happened. Be confused. Malaysia Airlines operations had told Lumpur Radar Control that Flight 370 You're was in Cambodian airspace. But as Vietnamese controllers confirmed, Flight 370 was never supposed to enter Cambodian airspace. It was supposed to fly over Vietnam. And besides, Cambodian controllers couldn't see Flight 370 on their radar. So where was the flight? Was it over Cambodia or Vietnam? Or was it in the air at all? In truth, all parties involved were being duped by the software Malaysia Airlines used to track flights, which merely projected the plane's last known position out into the future. Oh, in the cockpit no. of Flight 370, Zahari could see on his CCTV display that the first officer was laying slumped against the cockpit door. The one person who stood a chance at thwarting his plans had been eliminated. Just in case there was anybody left, he picked up the microphone and made a call on the intercom asking for somebody to come and help him in the cockpit. He watched the display carefully. Nobody came. At just after 20 past two that night, Flight 370 Wait, slipped off the radar. So until it, uh, until it, doesn't, it appears somewhere else and it gets pinged again, it stays idle in its last like last position. It's why it, it, it kept refreshing on that, on the other guys. That's, that sounds really like fucking dumb. Now, truly, the flight had gone dark. Over 200 people on board were dead, but at this point, an hour after it had turned back at Agari, barely a dozen people in the world even knew that the plane was missing. Zahari had been listening in to air traffic control on his radio set, and there were no signs of fighter jets being scrambled to intercept his plane. As it would turn out, military radar operators wouldn't even notice his flight on their screens until they played back a recording of them the next day. Safely beyond the reach of radar, and secure in the knowledge that he was now the only one left alive on board, Zahari was now able to restore full electrical power to the aircraft. He reached up to the overhead panel and re-energized both the left and right electrical buses. A host of onboard systems sprung back to life as the plane reconfigured electrically. The familiar hum of the fans below the cockpit resumed and they began cooling the hot computers. Zahari had made it. He had done the impossible and made a Boeing 777 disappear into the night, never to be seen again. It would be morning before anybody began searching for the aircraft, and they would begin by searching the only logical place, the South China Sea, where the flight had disappeared from secondary radar. The sensible conclusion for rescuers to draw, given that the plane had disappeared suddenly and without sending a distress signal, would be that a bomb or a catastrophic structural failure had downed the aircraft. Zahari knew that in the days and weeks that followed, it was possible that investigators would review tape recordings of primary radar and see that the plane had turned back at Agari and then turned again at Penang and flown up the Strait of Malacca. But he knew that this is where the trail would end. Guys, guys, if guys, even in 2014, it would be a, 
a, a humanity failure to have a thing this big with that much people disappear from anything anybody can fix in on any of these systems and people and or it is it it just it's a everybody failure but he knew that this is where the trail would end if authorities were smart search and rescue operations it would focus on the andaman sea and the failure. bay of bengal and this in zahari's mind was the beauty of his plan because now out of radar coverage he would pull off his final trick once he had flown past the island of sumatra he would turn to the south and take his 777 deep into the southern Indian Ocean. Nobody could possibly know that he had taken this turn, and even if they somehow did, they wouldn't be able to find him. The Indian Ocean is enormous, and with over five and a half hours of fuel Chad, still on board... What annoys me even more about this guy is that he could have killed more people if the goal was to kill people. It's almost like he wanted to do an aviation feat, right? And his only way of doing it was if there was civilian casualties. That was almost how it feels. Literally, that's that's what that's pretty much what this he is telling me. Deep into the middle of it. I'm making an analysis as here. As far as the hurry was concerned, analysis. this plan was foolproof. Except, it wasn't. Zahari didn't know it, but the Satcom, which had been rebooted when he restored power to the main electrical generators, wasn't just a passive system. It wasn't like the radio antenna on board the aircraft, which simply received radio signals and sent them only on request. When he restored full electrical power to the aircraft at 25 minutes past two that morning, a component of the SATCOM, the Satellite Data Unit, or SDU, rebooted. And when it did, it sent a message to a satellite high above the Indian Ocean, saying as much. This satellite was operated by a company called Inmarsat, which stands for International Maritime Satellite. The plane's SDU told the satellite, or more accurately, told the ground station in Perth, Australia, which the satellite acted as a conduit for, that it wanted to log on to the satellite network. This log on request was proof that the plane was still in the air, or at least that it was still intact. And what's more, every hour the ground station in Perth would send a message to the plane, which the plane would respond to, confirming that it was still on the network. What this meant was that Zahari was dead wrong in his assumption that he had completely vanished. He continued up the Strait of Malacca oblivious that he was carrying with him an enormous liability. But he couldn't be blamed for thinking that the SATCOM wouldn't give much away, other than the fact that the plane was still flying. After all, this log on request contained no information. From the satellite's point of view, it just got a message from a Malaysia Airlines plane asking to log on to the network. This message didn't say where the plane was or anything else of the sort. Oh, but it has a range that you probably However, it. it did contain elements. one piece of information, which in a week's time would shock the world. An engineer at Inmarsat would take a look at this logon request and have an ingenious idea. Attached to the signal sent by the plane was a timestamp saying when it was sent. The satellite also recorded when it had received the signal from the aircraft. And the time. And so, by comparing these two times, That's so it was sick. possible to determine how long it took the signal to reach the satellite. The engineer who looked at this data realized that because this signal traveled at a known speed, the speed of light, he would be able to determine how far the plane was from the satellite when it sent the signal. He carried out this calculation and got an answer for how far the plane was from the satellite when it sent the logon request. Simple a physics a and a spark of yeah. insight had shown that at 2.25 a.m. on the morning of March 8th, Flight 370 had been somewhere on this ring. Not inside of this ring, but on it. Everywhere along this ring was the same distance to the satellite. My Guys, guys I had to say chat. I had to say, I'm going to say chat. Guys, this is Minecraft cord shit. It's same, same system. Since the last known position of the plane on primary radar was just three minutes beforehand, here, it would be impossible for it to have traveled all the way to Africa or India or way south in this time. It had to have been somewhere close to the last known position on an arc about this length. And so the first arc was born. Zahari had just given investigators the ultimate clue. Because it's in ring. Yeah. And what's more, it wouldn't just stop at one ring. A new ring, and therefore a new arc, would be formed every hour, when the ground station in Perth inquired about the plane's online status. These routine exchanges would come to be known as handshakes. One arc every hour for as long as the plane was in the air. From this point on, the story of Flight 370 Damn, look is the at story it, uh... of these arcs. Holy On board dude, Flight 370, the mission to Oblivion continued. 
Zahari repressurized the aircraft. With everybody behind him incapacitated or dead, there was no need to keep the air pressure so low. Now, mask off and out of radar range, Zahari could begin the next stage of his mission, turning the plane to the south. Out his left-hand side, he watched the lights of the distant towns on the coast of Sumatra glitter. When he was beyond them, he would make his- This debunks Netflix because Netflix had, had a bunch of dumb shit fucking uh, uh, interviews what MR sat, can't do this, can't do this, blah, blah, blah. And they waste time on some bullshit fucking garbage. Move. It's so bad, dude. As Zahari watched and waited, Malaysia Airlines Operations Center back at Kuala Lumpur was growing increasingly concerned. It was unheard of for a plane to be out of contact for this long. At 2.38 that morning, they sent a message to the aircraft over ACARS, which was supposed to appear in the cockpit here. But this message was not received by Flight 370. Zahari had severed the connection between ACARS and the SATCOM and VHF. The airline sent the message again at 2.39am, but it didn't arrive this time either. Had the flight experienced some kind of massacre electrical failure? Was it lost over Southeast Asia? Or had it landed somewhere in Cambodia? But then, Malaysia Airlines operations decided to call the plane over the SATCOM. In the cockpit of Flight 370, the SATCOM phone rang. Zahari saw the call come through on his screen. He now had confirmation that the airline knew that something was wrong with his flight. He watched and waited for the call to finish ringing. After a few seconds, it did. Zahari wondered whether the ground would be able to tell the difference between a call which had gone unanswered and one which didn't reach the aircraft in the first place. But at this point, it barely mattered. The airline was still trying to locate the plane somewhere over Cambodia. In fact, less than 10 minutes earlier, it had told air traffic control the plane's coordinates, well, according to their flight like tracking one software. At the wrong spot. They had no idea how far off they were. In fact, it would be another hour before Malaysia Airlines realized that the position updates they were getting were simply from the projected path of the aircraft on the flight tracking software. They sent another ACARS message at 2.40am and another a minute later, but each time the message was not received. Operations didn't know it, but Zahari had disabled the VHF and SATCOM link to the ACARS. None of their ACARS messages would get through. Just as Zahari had expected, the Malaysian military had been asleep at the wheel. They had failed to identify an unknown target for more than an hour as it passed right through their airspace. That's what I said! Under the cover of darkness, and having completely duped the authorities, Zahari would now make his final turn south. He twisted the heading select knob to the left, and the 777, Zahari's unwitting accomplice, obliged, hey, said, is, uh, completely said, oblivious to the oh, mission it was part of. It's just a dot. For an hour straight? Bro. Please. As Zahari turned south, he could picture the headlines which would appear in the newspapers over the coming days. He could envisage the countless theories which would be put forward to explain the mystery. He knew that as long as the wreckage was never discovered, there would always be a shadow of doubt as to what had caused the plane's disappearance. Some would say that what happened on this night was a tragic accident, that some combination of electrical failure, rapid decompression and pilot incapacitation led to Flight 370 going missing. But these theories, which we will call accident scenarios, all have massive flaws. If there had been an electrical failure big enough to incapacitate the pilots, why did the satellite data unit come back online an hour after it was disabled, and stay working for hours afterwards? Usually, when electrical systems fail, they stay failed. And if the pilots were so incapacitated that they couldn't get the aircraft to descend and get back to an airport, why were they still conscious enough 30 minutes after the emergency began to turn at Penang, and then more than 40 minutes after that to turn again out over the open ocean? Yeah, What's yeah. more, is why does a plane not have a system that says, "What the fuck are you doing? This is so everything is so off course. I'm taking control. Fuck y'all, and it's it's auto it pads itself, bro." And then when it hits it reaches the tower, you can control it remotely from somewhere else. Because fuck Why people inside the bricks. Why inopportune places? Why was every turn timed perfectly so as to avoid detection by air traffic controllers, civilian and military? Anybody who believes the disappearance of Flight 370 was an accident also has to reckon with the fact that the aircraft's problems started exactly when it reached Igari, the transfer of control point between Malaysian and Vietnamese airspace. If an accident had caused Flight 370 yeah, to go missing, like then it would much, seem yeah. that chance itself had framed the pilots for the disappearance. Others would say that a hijacking best explains the aircraft's disappearance. 
But if that were the case, this would need to have been the most technically sophisticated and yet ultimately the most fruitless hijacking of all time. These hijackers had clearly done their research. They knew the surrounding airspace inside out, judging by their ability to evade detection by the military radar for Bruh. over an hour. If they were hijackers, dude, why did they do all that, bro? Bro, you just fucking pull the lever down at that point, right? And I mean, if you, they had if, intimate if, if knowledge of how to fly I mean, and how to hide a Boeing 777. Why do all that? They apparently knew exactly how and exactly when well, to turn off not just the transponder, but the SATCOM and the ACARS too. These were no rookies. And yet, despite all of this planning and skill, these hypothetical hijackers appeared to possess a strange lack of conviction. An hour after disabling the SATCOM, they were kind enough to turn it back on. They were also considerate enough not to crash into any buildings, and they were selfless enough not to make any demands of any authorities on the ground. In fact, if a terror group was responsible for the plane's disappearance, it was apparently humble enough not to claim responsibility after the fact. Because nine years after the disappearance, such a claim of responsibility is yet to be forthcoming. This is not even to touch on some of the more outlandish theories, that the plane had been hijacked by the CIA via remote control, or that it had been sucked into a black hole, two theories of approximately equivalent likelihood. And that's only considering the evidence we've looked at so far. Those who believe this was an accident still have to contend with one more fact, and it's perhaps the most disturbing fact of all. As Zahari headed south over the Indian Ocean, this strange series of events was oddly familiar to him. That's because, just over a month before this night, he had practiced this journey on his home flight simulator. Hi everyone, uh, this is a YouTube video that I've made. Bro, on the evening of February it, huh? 2nd, 2014, Zahari had taken a simulated Boeing 777 up to cruising altitude and flown it along the Strait of Malacca. There was nothing particularly unusual about this, Malaysia Airlines had plenty of flights which went up the Strait of Malacca, and, like many pilots, Zahari sometimes practiced flights on his home computer. What was unusual was what he did next. Once Zahari had reached the end of the Malacca Strait, he turned the plane to the south, and then, he used the flight simulator's map function to drag it deep into the southern Indian Ocean. From there, he set the fuel quantity to zero and began gliding the plane. First, from an altitude of about 37,000 feet, and then from 4,000 feet. If this simulator route was a mere coincidence, then, once again, we would have to conclude that chance itself had it out for Captain Zahari on this night. Zahari undid his seatbelt and reclined in his seat. He gazed out into the darkness in front of him. For thousands of miles, there lay nothing but dark, deep ocean. Some of the deepest ocean in the world, in fact, and the most isolated too. Almost no shipping lanes traverse the southern Indian Ocean. It was now deep into the night on March 8th, 2014. But this date hadn't been Zahari's first choice. On February 3rd, when he used his flight simulator to fly to the southern Indian Ocean, he had set the date on the simulator as February 21st. Fans of coincidence are now in for another treat, because on February 21st, Zahari had been scheduled to fly Flight 370 to Beijing. That date was his first choice. The day before the flight, on February 20th, Zahari deleted his flight simulator from his home computer and disconnected the drive it had been stored on. Bro, but February 21st came in. Imagine knowing all about this shit and thinking, you're, you're, oh, I'm about to pull this super plan, whatever, and then not knowing you can do data recovery. Bruh. What the fuck? Went, this and Zahari guy, operated flight 370 uh... to Beijing as normal. The over 200 people on that plane had had a narrow it. escape. The passengers on the March 8th flight had not been so lucky. An hour since Malaysia Airlines had called Flight 370 over the SATCOM phone, Bro, the ground station in Perth initiated another handshake with the aircraft via satellite. The second arc was formed. A few minutes earlier, Malaysia Airlines had finally told Lumper Control that the position information they'd been providing them with for Flight 370 had actually been based on projected position and not on actual position. Their focus on Cambodia had been a total red herring. At this point, controllers considered that the plane might be on its flight plan route, but that it had experienced a communications failure of some sort. Oh. They began contacting Chinese air traffic controllers, as by this point, the aircraft should have been in their airspace. 
If the fight was running on time, guys, it should arrive in Beijing guys. in just under three hours. Silly. It just... In the cockpit it, of Flight 370, hundreds of miles to the south, Zahari twisted the altitude selector on the autopilot and put the plane in a climb. The higher he flew, the less fuel he would use, and the deeper into the ocean he could go. He knew that if he crashed far enough into the middle of the ocean, the crash site would never be found. Any wreckage which floated on the surface would take months, even years, to wash up on the shores of Africa and Australia. Perhaps investigators would piece together a rough picture of what happened, but without any hard evidence, his family and friends would be spared the shame of knowing with certainty what he did. There would always be a shadow of doubt as to what had happened to the plane. Out over the middle of the southern Indian Ocean, Sahari was now perhaps the most isolated person on the planet. For miles in every direction, there was not a single human life. No islands, no planes, and no boats. And now, even though his aircraft still had hours of fuel on board, there was no longer any reason for him to be part of this mission. He had carried out his tasks just as he had practiced for weeks. With the turn to the south complete, and his autopilot keeping the plane on course to the middle of the southern Indian Ocean, his presence on board was now superfluous. He would now slip into the night. For the second time that night, Zahari opened the outflow valves. Only this time, he didn't don his oxygen mask. Within seconds, he was breathing thin air at 40,000 feet. His thinking slowed, his senses dulled, and moments later, the lights went out. Flight 370 was now a ghost plane, whispering out over the dark, open ocean. As the hours went by, the satellite data unit on board continued its hourly handshakes with the ground station in Perth. Hourly? It was early morning in Beijing, and controllers were hoping to see a Malaysian 777 on final approach to the runway. Its fuck? scheduled time of arrival was 6.30 a.m. But this time came and went, and still, no plane appeared on the horizon. Families waiting for the arrival of their loved ones were told that the flight was delayed. Meanwhile, search and rescue efforts began in the South China Sea. With no contact for hours, rescuers were fearing the worst. Would they come face to face with the shattered wreckage of a fully loaded 777? They had no idea as they searched quite how absurd the situation truly was. At that very moment, the aircraft was still in the air. Only, it was thousands of miles to the south, and everybody on board was already dead. Malaysia Airlines Operations Centre made another SATCOM call to the cockpit of Flight 370. Incredibly, this was only the second call they made to the aircraft over the entire flight. But just like it had the first time, the phone rang out. This time, Zahari wasn't even there to see it. For the yeah. airline, Yo, there was no avoiding it. Two calls and one thing that says, that says they complain, pl please respond, acknowledge message, bro, please. Flight 370 bro, bro, is now the text, officially so, missing. They texted, they, they did it. Just before half past seven that morning, Malaysia Airlines issued please a press statement act. announcing that the flight was missing and that they were working with search and rescue authorities to find the plane. The world now knew that a Malaysian Airlines flight had crashed. What nobody knew, and what nobody could possibly have known, was that the aircraft was still very much in the air, still making its way south on autopilot as the sun rose over the southern Indian Ocean. An hour after the last satellite phone call to the plane, the ground station in Perth initiated another handshake with the aircraft, creating the sixth ring and therefore the sixth arc. Early morning rays of sun now streamed in the windows of the vacant plane, the sole witness of the silent horror which had unfolded hours beforehand. Wait, the scene on board is still though? like a photograph, capturing a moment from hours ago and frozen in time ever since. Nothing on board had moved since that moment. But this eerie serenity would soon be shattered. All of the pent-up violence which had been obscured by Zahari's yeah, modus operandi would now be unleashed bread. all at once. Shortly after 8 o'clock that morning, the right-hand engine ran out of fuel. To compensate, the left-hand engine went to full power. With this, the 777 began a gentle turn to the right. A few minutes later, the left-hand engine flamed out. The autopilot and autothrottle disconnected. The cockpit instruments went dark. I'm not dumb as fuck. Deprived of power worse. and electricity, Flight 370 was now at the whim of aerodynamics. The plane began slowing down and descending. 
it was the beginning of the end. Except, the aircraft had a final trick up its sleeve. In the 777, some fuel is reserved for the auxiliary power unit, the APU, in case both engines flame out. The APU is a small gas turbine engine in the aircraft's tail. Oh damn! It doesn't produce any thrust, but it does provide the plane with limited electrical and hydraulic power. In the case of a double engine failure, it starts automatically, and provides enough power to ensure that the aircraft remains controllable. But without the pilots at the controls, this was no good. Except, on this morning, this feature of the Boeing 777 would leave an incredible clue for investigators. The APU automatically started up, drawing from the small amount of fuel still remaining in the tanks. When it was up and running, electrical power was restored to the aircraft, bringing some of the instruments and systems back online. One of the systems to which power was restored was the satellite data unit. It sent a signal to the satellite above the Indian Ocean, just like the one it had sent almost six hours earlier, requesting to log on to the satellite network. This signal created a final ring, and therefore a final arc, the now infamous seventh arc. If the APU had not been restarted automatically, this signal would never have been sent, and we would never know where the plane had run out of fuel. This signal was different than the other ones which had been sent out over the Indian Ocean, in that it was not a handshake initiated by the ground station in Perth, but a log-on request initiated by the aircraft itself. Zahari could have had no idea that this arc would be created, pretty much confirming the plane's location in its final minutes. So... But this isn't for... So why, why do we have like 20 documentaries, 60 fucking aliens took a plane, and not just some guy says, yo guys, look, here's what the, 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 the data says. The data says that it made a request at this place, and then case goes for all, all conspiracies. The story ends, because uh, as it confused, turned out, yo. there was one more thing which could be gleaned from the signals sent to the satellite by the SATCOM. As the satellite data unit of Flight 370 powered up, multiple aircraft systems took turns logging onto the satellite network, each sending a signal within a few minutes of the other. When engineers analyzed the frequency of these signals from the 7th arc, they found something odd. They were at a lower frequency than all of the previous signals. After eliminating various possibilities, what remained was a clear answer. When Flight 370 sent these signals to the satellite, it was descending away from the satellite, stretching out the radio wave as it was being transmitted. Oh. This caused the satellite to receive a lower frequency signal. But investigators didn't stop there. By precisely comparing the normal frequency of the signals, which the aircraft had sent previously, with the frequency of the signals received from the plane on the seventh arc, investigators could determine roughly how fast the plane was descending when it sent these signals. At 19 minutes ah. past 8 and 29 seconds, Flight 370 was descending at a relatively normal rate of about 4,000 feet per minute. This is steeper than a plane would typically descend at, but it was within the ballpark for a normal flight. However, just 8 seconds later, when it sent another signal, the aircraft was screaming towards the ocean at an incredible rate of approximately 15,000 feet. They're, they're comparing the difference in stretch by ratio and, and assigning a value to that speed. Feet per minute. This was about 10 times the normal descent rate, and well beyond anything an aircraft like the 777 would glide at. Such an incredible rate of descent is consistent with the aircraft being in a steep turn, rolling onto its side as it fell towards the ocean. As the plane neared supersonic speeds, some of the control surfaces on the wing, including the flapper on, began to flutter, before detaching from the wing. Less than two minutes later, Flight 370 plunged into the ocean. At 21 minutes past 8 and 7 seconds, one more signal should have been sent from the plane to the satellite. This signal never came. Most of the aircraft was shattered upon impact, with the debris sinking for miles before settling scattered on the seabed below. However, hundreds of pieces began floating. Over the coming months and years, these pieces washed up thousands of miles away, on the shores of Madagascar, South Africa, Reunion, and Tanzania, among other countries. Over 30 pieces of wreckage have been discovered to date, both from the interior and exterior of the aircraft. A flapperon from the right wing, the plastic frame of an in-flight entertainment screen from the back of a passenger seat, a section of wall panelling from the forward cabin. 
Many of these. Some of this info that they got seems like you could get this within like a week or some shit like that. Or they send a subpoena and they get it within a, a, like instant, right? How the fuck are people learning about this if this was in 2014? Nine years later. 30 pieces have been recovered by one man, Blaine Gibson, which, aside from being a testament to his perseverance and dedication, indicates that there are hundreds or even thousands of pieces still waiting to be discovered along the shorelines of Africa and nearby islands, if only governments were so willing the to the data look. I'm saying. These pieces are the only hard physical evidence showing that the plane went down in the southern Indian Ocean, and therefore that it flew south after passing Sumatra, and not north, as some people had believed. Well, just why did they withhold the information? In the years since the disappearance, search teams carried out extensive underwater searches along the 7th Arc, mapping over 120,000 square kilometers of seabed. But so far, the plane's wreckage has not been found. Today, almost 10 years since the aircraft went missing, all searches have been called off, pending new and credible information on the plane's final resting place. But there is still one final turn in the story of Flight 370. Let's say that at some future date, maybe decades from now, we do find the wreckage. Would this bring us any closer to understanding why the plane crashed? The black boxes, if they still contain data after what might turn out to be decades underwater, may not have any recordings of the flight's final hours. That's because if Wait. the captain was intent on hiding the aircraft and on hiding his own culpability, he would simply have pulled the circuit breakers for the cockpit voice recorder and why, flight why data recorder not? shortly after asking the first officer to leave the cockpit. Nothing in the wreckage would point towards his involvement. Of course, such a finding as blank black boxes would be evidence in itself, but as always with MH370, the question lies in how this oh, evidence listen, should yeah. be interpreted. I, I listen, shut up, bitch. Those who favor accident he scenarios wasn't would use this as further evidence that a massive electrical failure befell the aircraft, while those who think that Zahari crashed the plane would use this as evidence that he was responsible. When something as seemingly impossible as the disappearance of a modern airliner happens, we naturally want the cause to be as big as the event itself. But in all likelihood, this was not a grand conspiracy by the CIA or the Russians involving spies or classified technology, nor is it likely that it was the result of a series of highly improbable accidents. Rather, all the evidence points towards a single, simple explanation. Deliberate, premeditated action by a skilled pilot, intent on accomplishing an unthinkable but entirely achievable goal, to make an aircraft disappear. This one, video one is not a definitive account of what happened on Flight 370. One Experts disagree on a number of important aspects of the flight, including whether there were any turns after the plane went south, and whether Zahari was dead at the end, as depicted in this video, or whether he glided his 777 over 100 kilometers from the point of- I enjoyed the video, I think it was really good. Guys, I'm gonna end right there because I wanna, I wanna play some, uh, I wanna play some GTA. Um, that was good though.